We'll, we'll bring up the second panel. We learned from uh, our first panel that volatility will remain low until it goes up. <laughs> and it may or may not change sooner or later. Thank you, Dino. Thank you, Kathy. Thank you, Don. Uh, Rhonda will come up and introduce her panel. start, um, you know, the first panel talked about currency volatility, and that is the central question. Why is currency central to your thesis when you're allocating to foreign equities? You know, do you really want that secondary currency bet on top of the local equity market returns? And a lot of times you could say the equity markets are very cheap in some of these foreign markets, but do you know which way the currency is going to go? And, and I argue a lot of people don't know which way the currencies are going to go, and they're basically taking that secondary risk that is really not something they get compensated for. So we'll talk about that. Um, you know, the, certainly Japan was the central case of a weak currency leading to a very strong performing market. And so you have these inverse correlations being one time when you particularly want currency hedging. Uh, but there's also this general question of why do you want to take that secondary currency bet on top of your, your local market return if you really just think the equities are really what you're trying to identify. So when you think about the broader national markets, we have a pie chart of where you know, the most important currencies are for the developed world. In, in the IFA market, which is the broadest index tracking international market, it's really four currencies are, are the, the lion's share. The euro is a third of IFA, the pound is 20, the yen is 20, and then the Swiss franc, which you could say is pegged to the euro, really. So that's 80% of IFA in those four currencies. And the question is, do you have a, an opinion which way the euro is going to go, which way the yen is going to go, or the pound? And if not, and you just want to diversify your equity set, why don't you currency hedge to get access to that? And that's, that's a really a, a key question. We've been talking with people about this currency hedge for the last four years, and I, I, try to, I, I keep hearing the same responses for why people haven't embraced currency hedging. And I think there's a few common myths out there in terms of currency hedging. We're going to try to address what those are uh, and then talk a little bit about the two biggest currencies, the euro and the yen, uh, in, in more detail as well. I, I think part of it starts with, in this first panel, address a lot of the, the, the central bank interventions that, that cause you to think about currency movements. And I think the central banks are a key part of what's driving currency movements over time. Uh, and if you, we, we created a pendulum of you know, tightening to easing in terms of where the major central banks are along the pendulum. And part of my view of why currency is becoming more important is that I think we could be entering a period where the dollar on a longer term basis appreciates. And, and that's partly driven by, I think, the, in terms of the major central banks, the US is closest to the tightening path. Uh, we're talking about tapering. We should be done by our quantitative easing program by the end of the year. 
when will Japan start their tapering process? I mean, they are by far the opposite end of the extreme, where they're the most aggressive central bank in the world today. They're buying $75 billion a month of securities, when the Fed ended up buying $45 billion a month. You know, the Fed was buying mortgage-backed securities and, and bonds. The Bank of Japan is buying long-term bonds, but they're buying real estate investment trusts directly, and they're buying ETFs. They own 40% of the entire ETF market in Japan. So talk about Janet Yellen coming out and saying she's going to buy the S&P 500. I mean, that would be a very big statement. They are directly trying to come out and target risk premiums for the market. So they're trying to get the markets to basically go up. They think there's a very positive wealth effect from that. The real estate market's just, uh, or more of an important market in Japan, is sort of five times bigger than the equity market. So their purchases of REITs has been very supportive to, to real estate. So they are by far the one extreme, and I think they're, they're going to be supportive. And I think really the case for Japan starts with the yen being flat to weakening. If you thought the yen was really going to go up, I wouldn't want you to be in Japan. You can just buy the, the yen directly. But is it, they're, they're the clearest case of, of where you could see dollar strength versus a foreign currency. The ECB is sort of stuck in the middle, I'd say. You know, have Draghi out there talking about trying, you know, the, the rising euros causing deflationary tendencies for, for Europe. And, and I, in some ways, I say he's trying to cap the euros upside. It seems like if you get much, it doesn't seem like there's a lot of upside past the 140 area, which seems to be high on his radar, where he keeps trying to talk it down and you're starting to get a little bit you know, more negative movement recently, but it's still been generally very strong. The question is, why take the euro risk when the head of the central bank is, is clearly focused on that factor uh, as creating deflationary tendencies? So I sort of talk about the euro as unrewarded volatility. Why do you think, you know, is there an expected positive return for the euro when the central bank's trying to cap, cap its move? So those are the three major central banks, and I think the Fed is closest to the tightening curve, and, and that will be the one, I think, where it's, you know, shift towards the dollar away from the euro yen. Uh, the Japan's the clearest, the ECB's sort of in the middle there. Now, I'd say the biggest misconception, so this is when you say, well, why don't you do currency hedging generally? This is the number one answer I, I get back. Well, it's expensive to hedge your currencies. And I say, well, yes, in some markets, so Brazil or Turkey or India, which have been hiking their short-term rates aggressively, yes, it's very expensive to hedge the real, over 10%. The rupee, Rajan came in in September, aggressively hiked rates. Yes, it's, it's expensive to hedge rupee. I'd rather go along that over time because they sort of discount to, to purchasing power parity. You could collect that interest rate. But the cost to hedge is all based on relative interest rates. So if we're at zero in the, in the US, Europe's at zero, Japan's at zero, you know, the cost to hedge, the euro, yen, and, and the pound are largely close to zero. I mean, those, that 75, 80% of IFA is in, in currencies that have nearly a zero cost to hedge. And you may actually get paid to hedge these currencies. So if we actually are the first central bank to raise rates and Europe and Japan are lower for longer, you can envision a scenario where you're going to get paid to hedge the euro and get paid to hedge the yen. And then the question is, why would you actually have that risk? You know, it would be expensive to hold euro and yen. And I think that's going to be the situation you're at in the next two years at some point. And more and more people go towards currency hedged ETFs if you know, the Fed is raising rates and becomes expensive to hold the euro and yen. Uh, and again, so I, I definitely make this demarcation between the expensive to hedge countries, between Brazil, India, high emerging market countries versus the developed world where it's really a free option. And then you gotta have much more conviction to take on that euro and yen risk when it's essentially a free option to hedge it. The second argument I hear, you know, why they don't hedge the risk is, well, they like the diversification they get from these foreign currencies. And do you really, is, that, is there really something true to that, that you actually get something positive, beneficial to having a, a diversification from having your euro and yen exposure? And I sort of ask the question, you know, what, what is it hedging? Well, it's, it's hedging my, my purchasing power for my dollar. We, we track inflation over time. Uh, the inflation for the last, since IFA's been around in 1970, has been about 4% a year. Well, the dollar, yes, it has depreciated over that 40-year period, but it hasn't really kept up with inflation for the U.S. The, the EFA currencies have appreciated about 1.6% a year, so you sort of suffered, it, it didn't keep track of that inflation of 4%. What does actually offer long-term hedges against inflation? I think stocks. I mean, dividends grow with inflation over time. Just in the S&P, dividends grew 1.5, 1.6% ahead of inflation, so you could say stocks have a long-term hedging characteristic of inflation. Uh, even, even the EFA dividends grew ahead of inflation over that 40 years versus the EFA currencies, which only appreciated by 1.6%. Uh, but I think one period in particular really questions whether or not the euro and yen and the pound made good hedges against U.S. inflation. And that's this period between 78 and 85, when you had 7.5% inflation in the U.S., one of the highest inflation periods, but the dollar went up 
about 40% cumulatively or 8% a year, you lost value from holding these EFA currencies. And I think that is one of the central times where you say, why is these foreign currencies a good hedge against U.S. inflation? So I think I'd say that having that exposure is again a myth to, to why is it beneficial to own foreign currencies when you're buying foreign equities. Now, when we talk about the case for hedging, you know I think a lot of it comes to Japan. Japan did very well when the currencies were down, and the question was, was well, that true generally? And we looked at the EFA markets, and we we put it into five distinct periods of trends in dollar weakening or foreign currencies appreciating versus the dollar strengthening foreign currencies uh, depreciating. And there's two periods in particular where you see you know, larger, larger trends of the dollar strengthening. The first is that 78 to 85 period. The second is from 95 to 02. Uh, and and it's, what's interesting is you know, one of the very best times to own the international markets was when their currencies were going down. So exactly like Japan. So from 78 to 85, those currencies lost 8% a year. It was the single best time to own that market, up 17% a year. You know, much higher than the long-term average. And so you, you, you boil that down into the, t the times when the currencies were going down, the times where currencies were going up, and the, these international markets performed much better on average when their currencies were depreciating. 12% uh, versus just over 6% when their currencies were rising. So yes, actually most of the international markets worked just like Japan did last year on average over these last 40 years. Uh, and so it again argues for if you really want to target that, that time when it's best to own the markets, currency hedged strategies are the way to do that. You target that local market return, doing well when those currencies on a long term have been, been depreciating. So one of the things we did to, to reflect that at Wisdom Tree, we created a broad international index, hedging the same basic countries as IFA. We used one of our, our new dividend growth methodologies to, to help pick the underlying stocks within it. You can see the pie chart of where the currencies are exposed between Euro, Pound, Swiss francs, the Australian currency. It, because we use a growth and quality screen to, to select the stock, this return on equity, return on assets, earnings growth expectations, it's underweight some of the, the leveraged sectors like financials and utilities, overweight the higher quality growth oriented sectors like the consumer sectors and healthcare. But this is a, a new index that we, we launched and created a new fund to track this. Uh, IHDG, the International Hedge Dividend Growth, is the new ETF tracking this broad IFA type universe. But I think this is, as you think about how are you getting exposure to foreign markets, this is one of the biggest questions to ask, and this is a broad international option to do that on, on a very broad level. Uh, so I'm excited about that, that new strategy. Um, but where it started, and I want to come back to it, um, which brought people's attention in terms of the importance of currency hedging was Japan. And, and Japan, I think, is still one of the more interesting markets around the world, and it's not just from the currency moves, but the valuations, uh, one of the things that gets me still very optimistic about Japan is just the trends in earnings and, and valuation multiples. Uh, when you look, since Abe got elected at the end of 2012, Japan's been the best performing regional market, but amazingly, the valuations have actually gotten better. So despite being up over 50%, it, um, the PE multiple was contracted because earnings were up more than the stock prices. You know, last year, the S&P was up 32%, but 12% was EPS growth. Most of it was PE multiple rising. And so generally, you know, the, the, the regional markets between Japan, Europe, US, three of the major, major developed world markets, Japan's actually the cheapest, in my opinion, and uh, on a PE basis. And the trend in earnings is more supportive because uh, we talk about U.S. margins being near all-time highs and they having to come down. Japanese margins are actually mean reverting higher, and so you have relatively low P ratios with positive trends on, 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 on margins supporting it uh, versus the other markets which have been driven by mostly multiple expansion. So Japan, I still think, is one of the better opportunity sets, but again, it comes down to if you didn't hedge your currency, you're sort of in the middle. You know, If you hedge your currency, you're up 45 50%. Uh, since Abe was elected, if you had, you know, if you, if you didn't suffer the, the 20 percent yen weakness that brought you down into the middle, if you didn't hedge the currency risk, and when you think about, a lot of people say, have we already missed it? You know, the markets moved so much, have we already missed the missed the party? And I say we're still only halfway there in a lot of respects, and and this is the 10-year chart for the topics and the yen, and it, it sort of illustrates the, the the tight negative tracking between the yen and the topics. Um, and I, it also says why I think we're only halfway there. In the, in the U.S., we're back to the pre-crisis levels in dividends and earnings and the S&P. Uh, well, where was Japan pre-U.S. financial crisis? Well, the topics was 1,800 and the yen was at 120. At sort of the bottom of the equity market and the top of the currency market, you were around 80 yen to the dollar. Today, we're at 102, a little bit below 102. 
So can you get back to 120? I think it's, it's absolutely possible to get back to 120. Um, but a key part of it is not just what the Bank of Japan is doing. We already know that the most aggressive central bank in the world, the other half of the equation is when does the Fed raise interest rates? Because right now, if you're a Japanese pension fund or an insurance company, the U.S. tenure at two and a half looks quite good versus their 60 basis points in their tenure. So what do they do? Because just like it costs us zero to hedge the yen, it costs them zero to hedge the dollar. And so they're fully hedging, if they're buying the U.S. Treasury, they're, they're hedging all that currency risk, they're collecting the 200 basis points positive spread, and that's a great trade for them. They'll do that all day long. But if we actually ever raise rates to 2%, or 2% or higher, that's when a lot of those currency hedges come off. And I think, you know, that's why one of the things I say is Japan's sort of a longer cycle. You gotta have the Fed raising rates before the yen continues back towards that 120 level. But then I think that's also very supportive for the equity market to see continued gains for a lot of their large exporters, which have a global revenue basis and, and get positive profit gains when the yen is, is weakening. Uh, and so I think you could very much get back to that 1800, 120 level. And, and the topics would be 50% higher from here if it got back to that 1800 level. And so all, in, in the next three to five years, I think those are very reasonable expectations as the Fed normalizes policies, the Bank of Japan is likely to be be lower and more accommodative for longer. And I think you can get back there on, on both those regards. And, and given, you know, when you, when, you, when you read their statements, I mean, they're trying to tell you what they're trying to do. So this is from their, their second in command at the BOJ, Mr. Iwata. And he talks about why it's so important to confront deflation and, and how, you know, market participants with, with rising inflation expectations, they're gonna shift their portfolio from cash if you look in the blue bar, that's how much cash the Japanese citizen has, which is 54%. How much is in equities and, and funds? Very little, 10, 10 to 12%. And it's starting to increase because they're starting to expect inflation. It made sense to have all their money in the bank when they had deflation. And it made sense for the, the, the insurance companies or in life and, and the pensions to have a lot of JGBs when they had deflation. But now that inflation is coming, and they were actually very successful in generating inflation last year, you gotta start shifting, how do I get inflation hedges? Well, we say, well, what's the next move in Japan's markets? Are there any buyers left? The only buyers have been foreign buyers. The, the local institutions, the local Japanese have not actually got involved yet. And so if they, that's, that's one of the reasons why there's still more catalysts to come is that they actually convince their local markets that there's gonna be inflation, then they should shift out of cash, out of bonds, more into assets that participate from inflation and dividend stocks. Uh, and real estate are, are some of the beneficiaries. They talk about, you know, you would expect people to go overseas to higher yielding markets and for the yen to depreciate. Again, it's coming largely from the head, when they're the heads of the central bank. And so if you're trying to fight the BOJ, I think that's a, a very tough fight to, to have over long periods. Now, because we're at Wizard Tree, we're, we're pretty optimistic about what's, what's going on in Japan. We've created a whole suite of currency hedge options for Japan. We had you know, DXJ, which is the large cap exporters. We've created small caps for the more local part of the economy, uh, and then a suite of sectors. So whether it's financials, real estate, healthcare, TMT, or, or another more, even more yen sensitive basket, the capital goods companies. We're trying to give people more specific plays. People have not been in Japan for the last 25 years, and we think that it is one of the more interesting markets on a valuation case, as well as you know, the, the idea that if you really want to buy Japan, you can't view the yen being positive at this point. And so you really got to hedge your currency there. And so when you look at the, the, the differential in returns, just since we launched these sectors, I mean, it's, it's one of the interesting things is people say this consumption tax they did in April 1st is creating a lot of uh, conundrums for people. Like, is it a, really what they need to be doing? And what, what I find fascinating is the small caps have basically outperformed the large caps four to five percent this year. And you can say the small caps are the most consensitive to the local consumption. And so I say, you know, the consumption's really been a non-event. The, 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 What's been hit has been the large cap exporters, which have been trading down on the U.S. tenure going down to two and a half. It's really global growth concerns, U.S. growth concerns, more so than what's actually happening in Japan. And, and the large caps really trade off of what's happening in the U.S. and China more than they do what's happening in Japan. And so if you, if you want to really leverage play on global growth, it's the Japan large caps. If you want something more in the, the, the local economy, the small caps are one. But both of them, I still think you need to really hedge your currency when you're getting access to it. Now, when, when the idea of, you know, the, the valuation to the stocks is really attractive, do you really want the euro risk? I think that comes back to the European question. Uh, we look at the, the spreads and valuations within the equities, and 
what's interesting is you look at their, their earnings yield, which is just the inverse of the P ratio, and compare that to the bond yields. And some of the large European markets, whether it's Germany, Switzerland, France, UK, they have spreads between their earnings yield and bond yields that are 300, 400 basis points higher than their long-term average. You look at the US, and our, our spread is higher than our long-term average by, you know, Average in, since 98 was 1.5%, now it's 3.5%, but we're, we're not quite the four to 500, 600 basis points in Germany or, or, or Switzerland, but is the euro really cheap? Or do you even know if the euro is cheap or expensive? That, and that's a tough question to answer. You see the valuations are attractive in the stocks on a, on a historical basis, uh, but what do you think about where the euro is going? That, that's a much difficult, more difficult question. Uh, so when you look at the historical contribution to volatility in the euro area, the euro's added 20 to 40 percent of the volatility to European equities. We, we show you know, the green bar is the euro volatility, the blue bar is the local markets, and the orange bar is the volatility to just the U.S. investors who had both the euro and the equity volatility. And you could really say, I want the cheap valuations, but I don't want to take that, that euro volatility. Uh, I do think it's a, a source of unrewarded volatility. There's no reason to think the euro should always appreciate versus the dollar. Some periods it helps you. Uh, it's helped you over the last 10 years. It's helped you over the last five years. It hasn't helped you over the last three years, but we may be entering this period where the, year, you know, the dollar appreciates on a more long-term basis, and then you, you want to hedge that, hedge that volatility there. And in, in Europe, it worked very much like you know, where the, the down currency was a much better time to own the European markets. When the European currencies were going up, their average return was only 1% a year. When their currencies were going down, the average return was only 14% a year. So it again gets back to a lot of these markets have worked like Japan in the past, where depreciating currencies is very supportive for their local equity market returns. Uh, and you can see some of the, the periods in particular here, the 92 to 01 period, the European currencies for 10 years lost 6% a year, but the markets were up 20% a year, the single best time to buy these European markets. So again, it argues for if you think the dollar is going to appreciate, that could be very supportive for their exports, and you want to buy those European stocks hedging those currencies. How do currency hedges actually work? Just briefly, uh, you know, the way the strategies work, and to the point about whether or not it's expensive to hedge them, you roll non-deliverable for con contracts on a monthly basis, and so you look at how much assets are tied in one of these funds, you put on that notional amount of, of currency hedges, and you roll that on a month on a monthly basis, because the, the equities and the currencies are gonna move in a slightly different direction, so you gotta rebalance at some interval. We, and most of the people who are out there offering currency edge ETFs are doing on, on a monthly basis in a very similar framework. And, and when you ask the traders, how much does it cost you to hedge it? What is the bid-ask spread of the currency forwards? We've gotten feedback that these markets are so liquid, the developer currencies are so liquid, it could cost you three or four basis points a year to, to roll these forwards on a monthly basis. Uh, three to four basis points a year. That's how liquid these, these forward markets are. So there's really not a, a huge cost to hedge. I showed you the chart early on about the relative interest rates. That's the most important cost to hedge. So again, Brazil and India think high cost to hedge. Europe, Japan, Swiss, very low cost. Maybe you actually get paid to hedge it. So th that's the mechanics and, and it's pretty straightforward to, to how that actually works out. And, and just wrapping up and we'll, we'll turn over to Joe. Um, but I think Currency hedging, when you look at the ETF market, it's the, the single most important thing happening in the foreign developed markets. Uh, I do believe that the dollar has a, a period of, of strengthening over a longer paces. And if you think about you know, what risks are you being compensated to take, currencies are supposed to be a wash in the long run. Why do you want to take that volatility? It's a very important question you have to ask when you're allocating to foreign stocks. And there is a lot of good opportunities, I think, on a valuation standpoint, whether it's Europe, Japan, being cheaper than the US, but perhaps you don't want that currency risk. So with that, I'll turn it over to, to Joe. Fortunately, Jared, I'm going to I can speed through some parts of this because I think Jeremy covered a lot of the, the general themes around currency hedging and ETFs and the mechanics, which are uh, similar in, in a lot of ways between what Wisdom Tree and iShares are doing. And in fact, I think you have the right the right two issuers on this panel between um, iShares and Wisdom Tree. We certainly have more more currency e shares currency hedge ETFs globally than anybody else. So uh, for us in the United States in iShares, we are a little newer to this. We've launched our first currency hedged equity funds uh, in the first quarter of this year. 
But going back to 2010, you'd find some usage funds in the UK I share, some others in Canada, across the spectrum. So it is, isn't it a brand new theme, and it's uh, timely to be talking about it now. But I would, I would amend a, a couple of things that, that were in the opening of this, which I agree with, but I'll add my own amendment, which is a little contrary. And one is that uh, currency hedging is an important theme right now. I'd say it's absolutely important, except for when it isn't. And you'll see what I mean. And the second is that the risk isn't compensated, which I completely agree with. In the long term, you'd see that. It plays out either way, except when it isn't. And I can't tell you which way to go. I'm not a currency strategist or an FX guy by, by trade, so don't ask me to predict the end move in the next 12 months. But I will tell you how we're trying to build products uh, for the types of investors who who do have a view, who are trying to invest more tactically around currency. And really at the root of it, there's, there's three main themes that kind of drive our product development, particularly these currency hedged ETFs, and I'll leave those out. One is the, the underlying investment, uh, and, and Jeremy laid out from Wisdom Free's standpoint how you, know, how you can take a point of view with how you, how you design from the ground up the types of equities that are held in the portfolio. Um, we're using a different index, so I'll explain that as well. A range of choices, you know, having, having things to use uh, in different environments, different, different, different equity exposures, but also if one wants to be long or short the currency, uh, this was driving some of our own decision making. And finally, the ease of implementation. And this is really key, I think, because since we're on an ETF panel, it really can't get much easier than an exchange traded fund. It's one ticket, one trade. The currency hedging is embedded in there. It's inexpensive. This has already been discussed. So just a little background, you know, we're, we're uh, I'm from iShares, but we, iShares is a business within BlackRock, so essentially we're from BlackRock, which has a long history in currency hedged uh, exposures for, for all sorts of clients. We're currently running about $80 billion in currency hedged AUM, trading about $40 billion per month, so rolling those exposures for, for clients through internal and external mandates. So it's not new to, to the firm, but for iShares in the U.S., it's something new. We, and we were able to leverage an existing product set to get uh, to a design that we think is actually helping us get out of the gate a little faster with some of these currency hedged ETFs that I'll discuss with you in a minute. You know, it is notoriously hard to predict these kinds of movements. So I have, uh, the reason I have some notes here is because we have looked at some of the flows more recently to see what people are doing in ETFs. Uh, but one thing to get right out of the gate is uh, just the basic create redeem process. And I'll spend just 15 seconds on this for anybody in the room, um, and Jason, you can correct me if I miss anything, but uh, one of our capital markets people back there. Essentially, an exchange-traded fund is, is the liquidity of that fund is, is driven from the underlying holdings, right? So, so you can have an ETF that has uh, 5, 10, 15 million of assets, but someone can come in and, and create 100 million of it if it has liquid enough holdings inside. I think these are liquid stocks in developed markets, S&P 500, et cetera. Um, that's, that's something to keep in mind, and I think as an ETF grows you know, into the billions, it has its own liquidity that takes on the role of absorbing a lot of those orders and so that the market maker no longer needs to go to that primary market, in this case Japan or Europe or IFA, to buy and sell those securities. Now that, that underlying liquidity was helpful to us at iShares because we had a pretty well, we do have a pretty well established set of international uh, equity ETFs, including you know, 40 or so plus country funds, a variety of uh, international exposures, most of them, not all, benchmarked to various MSCI indices, which is cap-weighted indexes pretty broadly used by some institutions. And you know, in the case of, of launching our first currency hedged ETFs in the U.S., we looked at where there was very large exposure in these broad equity uh, uh, the funds that were long the foreign Currencies, and we found EWJ was one of the biggest ones, our Japan fund, which is around 13 and a half to 14 billion in assets, trades about 400 million a day. So there's a there's an exposure which clearly has demonstrated interest in Japan, uh, Germany, which is also around six billion in assets, trading about 100 million a day ADB, and IFA, which is uh, the biggest of, of any, not the biggest, but among the biggest of all ETFs, with about 55 billion in assets and trading about a billion dollars in ADB per day. So when we looked at these three tickers, which are on the bottom, EWJ, EWG, EDFA, we try not to be too clever, added an H in front of them for the hedge. These are the new versions. You can pronounce huge, which is perhaps an ambitious uh, pronunciation, but I think uh, hopefully it'll fulfill that name sometime in the future. 
although it, it, these things do take time. Uh, in, in each of these, the, the case that's different here, I'll, I'll get right to the point of what we've done in ETF, is to put, instead of the underlying stocks inside the ETF of, you know, the Japanese securities and German securities, we found it would be easier in some ways out of the gate to put in these ETFs in the baskets. So when a person comes to market and wants to create new shares of huge, uh, I'm not sure if Germany or Japan will earn that moniker sooner, probably Japan. Uh, they, they just need to go get the underlying share, which is that ETF, EWJ, and then some cash, and then the hedge is put on by our VMs. It's quite simple. The benefit of that is that underlying liquidity we just talked about is accessed by the investors. So it does help keep the spreads tighter than they would be for a brand new fund out of the gate that's holding 300 plus Japanese securities, or German stocks for that matter. So that was one of the benefits of having kind of a broad product set to work with. And it was also consistent with what, what a lot of institutional investors were asking us for, people who were using these funds, which was that I want to have the same underlying equity exposure. The only thing I want to have different is, is my, my currency exposure. It can be long or short the yen. I can make that trade without really changing the underlying. So it's, it's just a matter, of, uh, a matter of simplicity. Now, I will say right now, we haven't seen since, since these funds were launched a whole lot of of, of flow into them yet, and clearly there's, there's been a bit of a change since what, what happened last year, at least in the, over the short term in Japan, uh, which we can cover in a few minutes here, but you know, this is something where, again, it goes back to currency hedging matters, except when it does, and I think when it, that means for the investor's time horizon, and the shorter time horizon, you know, it really matters more. For a longer time horizon, you see these, these differences uh, sort of wash each other out, at least in, in some developed markets. And here's an example of that. It's maybe hard to see, but I think you'll get this later. This is the, uh, the EFA exposure, the MSCI EFA, which again, Jeremy had in his presentation. You can see it's a lot of different currencies, a lot of pounds, some, some euro, a lot of yen in there. Uh, year by year, the movement of the FX as well as the underlying equity, uh, it, really, it really does move around a lot. Uh, so on a one-year basis, you know, there was almost a 4% difference between the hedged and the unhedged over the last year. Play that out over 5, 10 to 20, though, you see that annualized difference compressing down to less than a percent, 26 bips and, and 13 basis points over 20 years. Now, I don't, I don't know anyone who's held an investment for 20 years of this nature. However, they are, they are out there. Uh, some of the pensions and large-scale institutions we deal with are dealing with time horizons like this. And so they can wait for that sort of currency hedge uh, versus unhedged exposure to really narrow out. But over the shorter term, it does matter. And again, this gets to the philosophy of just having choices, having an exact same underlying exposure, the investment thesis being very simple, and hedging or not hedging. And we don't necessarily dictate the point of view. We'll provide the advice, but not tell the end investor what to do. So this, is, this was interesting to me to run a chart just on Bloomberg the other day of, uh, of the Jap Japanese yen versus dollar. That's the white line you see going up to peak. And you can't see the dates from where you are, but right before it takes that precipitous drop is around late 2012. So it's a familiar story. Everyone should know is when this, the yen started to weaken dramatically versus the dollar. The yellowish orange is the unhedged uh, MSCI Japan, and the green is the hedged version. So naturally, uh, they're, they're, those markets are rising as the equity market rises. But it was interesting to see how much uh, uh, last year, the, the difference was dramatic. It was something like, like as Jeremy said, 50 plus percent for the hedged versus you know 27 percent return for the unhedged, and that's both of those are attractive returns. And in fact, we saw uh, during the period last year when there were a ton of assets flowing into hedged uh, hedged yen exposures and equities, it was kind of curious that we actually saw seven billion dollars also flow into the unhedged EWJ. So there were people on both sides of this trade. I think most of that was in the fourth quarter uh, during a time when I, I can assume these investors were, were seeing the yen reaching some sort of, of, of change in trajectory. Uh, but whether or not we can explain it, it's happening. There are people on both sides of that trade. In year to date, which we don't see here, we've seen flow coming in to the unhedged exposure again up to the tune of about 500 million into that EWJ and nothing really coming into the hedged version. That's likely to change as, as the uh, underlying economic environment changes, but as I said in the beginning, I will not predict that today. There are far more qualified people to do so. 
So again, a little bit more about the exposure. If, if anyone's not familiar, the underlying index here is a very simple capitalization weighted index. Been around a long time, the MSCI Japan index. You see on the top, it's 100% hedged. They're, they're using the exact same securities, simply applying that hedge once per month in the methodology. Same way for both providers. It's, it's the beginning of the month set. That same hedge rate is kept throughout the month and then reset at the end of the month uh, in the product using non-deliverable forwards, which are settled in US dollars. Now the point, the point to see on this graphic is that Again, it's, it's just another illustration of the fluctuation between the yen and the dollar, all right? And we can see toward the tail end, 2012, 2013, when there really is a, a, a negative uh, net return for, for an investor in an unhedged versus a hedge exposure, hedged to the, hedged to the dollar. So that exposure to the yen hurt, hurt folks, uh, even though the Japanese equity markets were rewarding them. Uh, but you can see over the longer term, it is hard to say, and I, and I guarantee you even as much as we say there shouldn't really be any expected return from FX, really it's just risk and managing that risk. There's always someone out there who thinks they can win. And uh, you know, again, it's all about having the tools for, for those really well-qualified uh, FX investors. Make sure it's okay, I'm fine. okay, this is just simply a breakdown of the sectors and the capitalization weighted MSCI index. Uh, you'd see there really isn't any, any point of view out here other than capitalization weighting, as I mentioned. So this is the same weightings for the EWJ or the HUWJ, aka huge investor. We're focusing on Japan right now. And it's interesting to see, it, it's certainly unpredictable, but um, at least unless you're an analyst in some of these sectors perhaps, but some of the, how some of the Japanese sectors have performed through this, through this cycle of, of weakening in the yen. The black line is representing the, the yen versus the dollar again falling. Through, through late 2012 and through 13. And in the sectors that we'd see rising, uh, you know, many parts of the market were on, as a whole doing very well. Uh, it was interesting to see though financials and telecom two toward the top, consumer staples. Uh, and, you know, these situations change, but this is a, a, a examination of how you know, this kind of broadly diversified exposure is playing out well for certain types of investors who don't really have um, a point of view in any particular sector want that broad representation. And again, historically, it's hard to see the graphic here, but on the bottom, you're looking at three month on the left and 10 year on the right, the purple being the uh, unhedged and the green, the hedged exposure. Uh, again, these differences are, are greater in the shorter term. Again, it matters except when it doesn't, which is the shorter term, not having a point of view, but for investors who do, the product is there. But again, over the longer term, we see two and a half percent, the same, same return over 10 years for these two exposures. And so, again, this, you know, for a long-term investor, currency volatility really just adds volatility and, and not much expected return. Uh, but that can be managed within any kind of time horizon. So I, I think I mentioned already a few of the highlights of this product, which is that it holds in, in the so-called basket, EWJ, that super liquid large security. And that stock is really considered a, just one uh, U.S. stock. It trades in U.S. markets, so it's treated like one U.S. security, like any other uh, large cap name would be. So from a market maker's perspective, to get a little bit into the weeds, uh, this, this creates a lot of simplicity in a couple of ways. Number one, the market maker who's helping create redeem shares of this particular ETF just has to go out and gather uh, shares of EWJ at, at one stock and then deliver it to us. We deliver them back the ETF. Uh, if they in, in the same same amount, and it goes both the other way on the redemption. Now, the the mechanics of this there is a cost of that is a cost to create, which is larger typically for international funds and, and smaller for U.S. domestic large cap funds, things like that, which which it, it really dictates uh, is is dictated by the the complexity of the basket and the underlying securities. In this case, that create fee is a hundred dollars, right? It's treated as one U.S. stock versus it would be about $5,000 if we were to use the MSCI index of all these individual Japanese securities. And it becomes a lot more for emerging markets and things like that. And so what this allows the fund to do is have right at the outset a slightly tighter spread than it would otherwise if it were to hold all of those underlying securities because it's leveraging this existing deeply liquid stock which is itself a representation of all the US, excuse me, uh, Japanese stocks. 
So as a result, the bid ask spread is about a, is about a penny on HEWJ, and, and which is uh, again considerably better than it than it would have been otherwise. I'll just go a few minutes more, and then and I think we'll get to questions with Rana. But again, Germany is another exposure, and the reason to select Germany, it's a similar case, right? I think what we found with a lot of investors who we talked to was that they had a view on the euro, but not necessarily a unified view on Europe itself. Um, many of them wanted to stay as far away as possible from Italy and Spain, but they liked a country like Germany, all of which were using the same currency. So coming out of the gate, we decided to do a German exposure. And that fund, as I mentioned, is about $6 billion in the unhedged version. Again, using EWG as the underlying security allows the uh, ETF on the hedge side to be much more liquid. Uh, this is a contribution of volatility over time, one year on the left, 10 years on the right. That pinkish gray bar is the currency ball. And again, it's, it's, it's significant, uh, but we won't necessarily project which direction it will go, but it's, it's meaningful over these periods, anywhere from four to seven percent volatility of the euro relative to the dollar. Germany, again, MSCI index, capitalization weighted, very simple and compatible with uh, the unhedged version that people are using. We'll skip through the sectors here and get to EFA. Similar case, EFA, high degree of uh, currency volatility but over the short term, but again, over the longer term, you'd see this play out to be somewhat neutral, at least historically it has been. Sector breakdown and the currencies versus the uh, unhedged currency exposures do tend to come much closer together toward the longer period. I'm not sure how you'd say this one, HEFA, HEFA, we're not, we haven't decided yet, but it's HEFA, putting the H in front, quite simple. And again, we're looking at a you know, penny wide spread on the size of this fund, that's about a basis point. So it does help to have this scale. Now we, we looked at expanding this even further. Um, I can say that we've filed prospectus for, for a European Union uh, hedged exposure, as well as in emerging markets, which will probably be more costly to run in the underlying, but hopefully we can leverage some of the existing EM product set that we have. Um, there's not much more I can say about those since they are still in the prospectus phase, but they are on the way. And again, I think that the the whole point of this was to illustrate how we think about developing these products. We think not only about the underlying exposure, but what it means from a liquidity and trading standpoint, because that's really where rubber hits a road with an ETF, is, is giving people something they can trade quite easily uh, with a provider who has the scale to enact the hedge efficiently and cheaply. Um, and it's really bringing that to people, both individuals and institutions across the market. Thanks very much to both of you. We will open now for questions. We do have a microphone, so just raise your hand if anyone has a question. Uh, when and if interest rates finally do diverge between some of the developed countries, uh, what do you expect to do with your products? Well, these are just tools. So they're, the currency hedge options are just are, are options that help manage that risk. And I think there is this big question of, you know, if the currencies are awash in the long run, why should you default to take the risk? I think that's a big fundamental question that people have to ask themselves is what, why are they taking that? Yes, they could be awash, but why add to your expected volatility? So that these currency hedge, I argue, is a more natural starting point than to have the currency exposure. But if they actually do raise interest rates in the U.S. first, it's even significantly better for these currency hedge strategies you get paid to hedge the risk. And then you can say it's very expensive to hold euro and yen if, we, if the US raises interest rates first. So if anything, it's just gonna become more and more important. I argue it's more important generally anyways, but the interest rates is the second, second component to it. Joe, anything to add? I, I, you know, for us, we, we, we do nothing because there is something on either side of that case. So an investor who's, who's using one and, and, and has changes their point of view can can do that very easily, and, and that's reflected, I think, in the flows we see in and out of these products. I completely agree that all the data supports over the long case, or the long term, currency is simply, at least in developed markets, adding to risk and not providing any expected return. Um, but we're, we're uh, honest with ourselves to realize that not all, not all our investors, or 
and the institutional and individual side are uh, holding for that long in the term, uh, despite the fact that they probably should. Over here. So when you were talking about when you um, put on the currency component of this uh, instrument, you're, you're putting it on the existing asset allocation of the underlying um, ETF. So um, you're assuming that the exchange rates that are moving um, are re fully reflected in the um, change in the underlying firm's performance that is then reflected in the stock market and then is reflected in the total ATM. So that assumes that the um, appreciation and depreciation across the different asset allocations are, are going to be reflected the same way over time across those different asset groups, those sectoral, asset, sectoral uh, allocations. And I'm wondering to what extent you believe that that, uh, that, that is true and how much you would rather build up your exposure um, so that you're matching your currency hedge to the sectoral asset allocation as opposed to matching your currency hedge to the overall package. So the way I, I, I would start by answering that is, you know, when, whenever you buy a foreign stock, you have to make two bets. You have to sell your dollars to buy the yen, and then, you gotta, and then you're also getting exposure to the, to the equities. And so the hedges are really just designed to, to target that local equity market return. And so we're just hedging out, there's no, it's, it's, instead of having the two bets, we're just, the hedge strategies are focusing on just the local market return. So there is this question of how much exposure to the end do you really want? And so then you can sort of look at what is the reaction to the various sectors or, and say it's gonna benefit these sectors. And the, cor the one thing that's true is correlations change across time, right? So right now there's a positive correlation between the euro and the stocks. That correlation changes. We saw that 92 to 01, it was the best time to ever own those foreign markets when their currencies were depreciating, which suggests there was a very negative correlation at that period. So, and there was a time when the yen was positively correlated between the stocks and the equities. I would argue it's gotta be a much higher level than you are today, uh, because I think if it went from 102 to, to 90, what that would mean it was probably a risk off environment, China's going bad, US is going bad, and you wouldn't want to own Japan generally. But that correlation can change over time, and you can sort of figure out what is your desired exposure, what is the optimal hedge ratio you want to have. I would argue you shouldn't be 100% one or the other. Like a more neutral starting point in my view is 50-50, and when you have a view, you want to add the euro or you want to add the end, you sort of add it. Uh, if you have no view, 50-50 is a much more neutral baseline than fully having it always or fully not having it always. But I hope that's sort of partly answered. And I, I, don't, I would add, if, if, if maybe it's clear, but the, the underlying securities in both of these, in all the indexes behind these products are all Japanese stocks denominated and priced in the end. So, so if there's any movement um, uh, in the end, it's, it's, it's really affects everything equally across these funds. And so you'd see certain sectors rise well. Now there may be some which may have different exposure internationally, but uh, at the end of the day, there really is, they're, all, they're simply equities and that, that foreign currency component is translated from US dollar, US into investor perspective. Yeah, I think her point is they have different betas, so they have a different sensitivity mm -hmm. to the move, and then the question is what, how do you ideally target that, right? And so that, I, I think that's a fair point, and you just gotta figure out how, what's, what's your optimal mix for given the exposure you have. Uh, this question's for Joseph. Just a practical question, when you so assume you're buying EWJ and contributing that to the currency hedge uh, uh, equivalent. Does the currency hedge equivalent actually hold EWJ such that you're paying two layers of fees on that? Or does it liquidate EWJ and, and take in the Japanese stocks? Yeah, that, that's a good question and a common one. Whenever a fund holds another fund, um, in, in our case, all of these, these funds, they basically waive the, the trust that holds, uh, that, that is the hedged fund, uh, hedged uh, uh, currency ex fund, ex Exposed to EWJ, basically waive that entire management fee, and then there's a, it's a simply new fee put on. So that uh, fund is, is 48 basis points, which is actually less expensive, I think, right now than than the unhedged version. It's got a little bit of a, a waiver on it as a, you know, a, a nice feature for new investors. Other questions? Um, yeah. Um, um, what do you do about any P and L that builds up on the currency contracts? 
think you had a slide on this. Yeah, I, I, didn't, I didn't mention the bullet, um, but it, that is a very good point. And so there is, the, the way that the, the taxation works on currency hedges is that they're distributed on, on an annual basis. If you have gains on the forwards, um, so let's say the yen depreciated, like, like it did last year, they, they get distributed on a 60-40 basis between, between long-term and short-term capital gains. Um, and that's just how forward taxation works. You can't, it's not like equities, you gotta expect a, a capital gain distribution from the forward contracts if you have a gain from that forward at the end of the year. The same, same structure for both funds, you're both using it together, so. Other questions? Well, while, while we think for a minute, I have a question for both of you. In terms of what you can share, the anticipated growth of these products going forward. And we touched on this a little bit, but how do these products evolve, say, five, 10 years from now, if you can even project that far out? Well, Japan started it off and it, and it woke people up, and that's, I think, you know, whether it's in the US or in your London offerings, that's where you've seen the most success, I think, within the ETF framework is, is the currency hedge in Japan. Right now, we're seeing money go to the European, so HEDJ is our European hedge to the euro, let's say like the European version of DXJ, and that's probably got about a, a billion today. Uh, you know, at the beginning of 2012, it was 25 million, so you're definitely seeing money go towards the European option. The other options have basically flat sat out there. There's, there's a UK, there's Korea, there's uh, you know, some other people have the broad EFA version. So there's, st there's starting to be some money moved to it. I think right now it's tactical allocators who say, I've got a view on the yen, I've got a view on the euro, and I can make that decision. But the bigger question, as, as Joe said, is the broad EFA is the biggest strategic international allocation. And that's the, that's the long term where people have to get to. And that's that fundamental reevaluation of why do I have currency risk in my international stocks when I'm buying these foreign stocks? And as we, as the ETF providers are out there educating clients on what is the additional return you're getting for having that currency exposure, it sort of it forces tough questions on people to reevaluate why are they taking on that currency risk. And I don't think there's a good reason to it. I haven't been convinced that there is that there is a good reason to have it. If you have one, I'd like to hear it. But as we keep having that argument, people will start asking themselves and they'll start shifting more and more. And I think it becomes more important. I can't tell you how quickly that happens, but we'll keep telling people that it's important and we'll try to keep raising awareness. I, I would agree with that. I would add that I think Japan is, is the perfect sort of spark for all of this, given that you have this inverse correlation. It's, it's a perfect test case for you know, how this should work in an ETF. Um, and that, that's a, an exposure where there, there, I wouldn't say it's a maturity, but there's a, a deep, you know, uh, a deep set of funds there now and, and more players coming to the game who aren't here today, but um, it will be hard to, to keep up. The, the funny thing is when we when we launched these funds in the beginning of the year, we, whenever this happens, you launch new funds, you get questions from our, our biggest clients who come back and say, what about this, what about that? And the thing they were saying the most was, what about emerging markets? Can you give me an EM hedged product? And as Jeremy pointed out, some of these markets um, individually are, are very expensive to, to run a hedge against versus DM, right, or, or Japan or Europe. Uh, nonetheless, we, we, we've got a team of people trying to do it. They're just gluttons for punishment, so they, they like this sort of thing and uh, hopefully they'll, they'll find that solution. But I think that's been the number one ask. Um, when it comes down to single countries, I mean, beyond some of the big ones like Brazil, Korea, you know, maybe India, um, there, I don't foresee personally a lot of, of opportunities, and at least not long-term, beyond just simple short-term tactical exposures that people might do, uh, because those aren't simply uh, big parts of a people's portfolio to begin with, right? And so if it comes down to these big exposures, EM, Europe, EFA, maybe Japan, uh, for many institutional investors. But beyond that, um, I don't foresee you know, a single country, a uh, Swiss franc hedge to the, to the dollar, something really taking off. Other questions? Did you get a lot of those emerging market calls after the turmoil in the emerging markets, or was anybody thinking about that ahead of time? <laughs> I, I won't say a few. There were a couple of people thinking about it ahead of time, and, and but mostly after, right? It's it, it is very, it, you know, it's transitory and time sensitive. But um, as I said, people are always, they're always looking for something to do, and, and you know, and until you know, three or four years ago, there was no way to, to use it to hedge your Japan uh, equity exposure. Now there is, and we've seen what happens there. So all it takes is is one bit of turmoil uh, or one sort of currency crisis to send a lot of flow into uh, various ETFs. Yeah. And what about volatility overall in these products? 
Well, you're seeing, I mean, in Japan, it raises the volatility. So the negative correlation, actually, mm -hmm. when you have a negative correlation, you hedge it, you're going to increase the volatility because you're going to more directly target that local market return. Mm -hmm. But you could argue it's the, the time you want to own it is when the currency is going down, right? And so that's, I think that's definitely the case for Japan. And, and so the best, it's, it's really the ideal case of when currency hedging works. So even when, when the euro is, is, is positively correlated and it has higher volatility to, to, to invest there, you're really buying it for it to become negatively correlated. I mean, you're buying it you know, right now to lower your volatility to, to, to buy European stocks. But the ideal scenario is for the dollar to go up, the European stock the currency to go down, and the European stocks to benefit. So you're always looking for this negative correlation, um, but you're sort of hiding out in lower volatility in the meantime. You're nodding, Joe, any? No, yeah, nothing to add to that, I think it's... Okay. Another question? So given that you... That Skip you one second, she's running over with the... So, so given that you're always looking for a negative correlation, but there are periods of time when it is not true, and I'll be talking about emerging markets uh, at the end of the uh, conference here, and I'll show you that they're not, it's not true for emerging markets. Um, uh, what's the temptation to start to actively manage the stock uh, stocks that are inside the underlying uh, ETF on which you are then layering your currency hedge? I think that's version you know, 2.0 of this is currency hedging. I mean, that's sort of what we're thinking about with our Japanese sectors, is, is trying to identify the sectors. So like the capital goods sector in Japan, for instance, I'd say is the most negatively correlated sector within Japan. So if you really want a yen sensitive bet, that's, that's probably been even more yen sensitive than DXJ, I would, I would argue. Um, but that is a, a, a natural evolution, is to get more specific in the stocks that could benefit from the currencies. So your very first question about you know, how do you dynamically allocate? I mean, EM is so positively correlated today because the money is sort of tracking, money flows go to EM, the currencies are very highly correlated to each other. Um, I'm not sure there's not a lot of negative correlating countries there, yeah. but there maybe China is one that you could say is, is one that's been negatively correlated, but it's a slow moving mm -hmm. currency. Um, but it's, it, that's, that's definitely a very interesting question. Yeah. I would, I mean, I would add, just to be clear on the iShares side, I think if a portfolio manager, at least in these funds, uh, desire to start getting active that way and seeking some alpha, they probably wouldn't be a PM very long because they're they're incentivized to simply track the index, the passive index product. They're not um, registered with the SEC as active products. And so the benchmark is, is what you should be getting and that's their goal to get as close as possible to that. Joe, Jeremy, I want to thank you for a very informative session. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Greg from GIC. David had to step out for an interview. We'll do a coffee break until 11. We'll start again for session three. Thanks.